It's always my favourite part of the show. It's Talking Pints. I'm joined by Dave Watson. Dave, thank you, mate, for being with us here in much. Dudley. You live just down the road. Now, look, Scots Guards beating your family, and there you are. You're 18 years old. You're a Scots Guardsman. Boots polished up like glass. And you're on ceremonial duty at Buckingham Palace. I am. How good did that feel? It was it life-changing. Because when I was a young lad and I'd been to London, I didn't think them guys were the military, you know what I mean? I didn't see that side of the military until I joined. And then I realised it was the military there. And, I and actually, one of the best sales points for Britain. Oh, yeah, you know, like, I mean, you know, foreign visitors come, they see the guards on duty at the Royal Palace and they think, wow, I mean, this yeah. is, this, the, these guys are impressive. My fault was all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you got, to, you got to know the Royal Family doing it. I did. And I'm told, rumour has it, you dance with the Queen. That can't be true. I did dance with the Queen, yeah. <laughs> Pretty, that is pretty amazing. That was how your soldiering career began, but of course the guards, fighting regiments, always have been for centuries, and you're off to Afghanistan, you're off to Helmen. There aren't many of our generation that actually know what it must feel like to be heading off to a real war. What was it like heading out there? It was, it was all right at first, but it was, it was when we, we got on that flight flying over there and that's when it became real. And especially when you're leaving your families behind. Yeah. Because you don't know whether you're going to come back or you don't know whether you're going to be seeing them again. So it's, that's what's the scary part. And then when you get over there, that's when, it, that's when it hits you. And you were out on patrol and you had the deep misfortune. It wasn't just you, it happened to lots of people, mm. of stepping on an IED. Do you, remember, do you remember much of it? I remember everything. I do remember you really? it like it was yesterday, yeah. Um, do you really? The doctors and that, what were there, they said, because of the size of me, I was, I was 6'1", and I was I were pretty built, and with the size of me, that's how I survived, and that's how I coped. If it happened to someone that was smaller than me, they wouldn't have had a chance. I mean, the extent of your injuries was, was massive, obviously. Uh, you, I mean, how do you... I mean, I've, I've been through... Very bad road traffic accident, plane crash, I've had bits of me broken and all sorts of things. Nothing like you've been through. But you sort of, sort of think you're recovering from these things. Was I really unlucky? Or was I really lucky? It's a really difficult one. How did you deal with all of that? Well, at first, you feel like you're unlucky. Mm. But then you, be, you come to hospital and you're in your ward. And the reason that I become lucky was there a guy next to me, a young lad, younger than me, missing both his legs, a few fingers, and he was blind as well. So he was worse off than what I were. Mm. And then it's when you, be, when you go to Headley Court, that's when you see all the injuries and you realise how lucky you are. And if this didn't happen to me, I wouldn't have met my wife, I wouldn't have had my kids, and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. So this, uh, this happening to me is the making of me. It's just amazing to see that positive mental attitude and actually quite inspiring, I think. I mean, it really is <laughs> inspiring. <laughs> when... I know you felt let down by the army and let down by the government when it came to the operation. Just, just share that briefly with us. Yeah, so in two... Like, I, I got up and walking and the sockets what I was using at the time were hurting me. They were breaking my scar tissue down, so I was bleeding a lot. So I was off my legs for two and a half years. And then I found an operation over in Australia, Osseo Integration. Got rid of the sockets. I have a metal implant inside my leg, and my leg connects to that. I did some research, and the operation was going to cost 124 to £125,000. I went to my regiment, asked for help. I did everything they asked. They still turned around and said no. I had to fund that myself from the compensation that I got from these injuries happening to me. Mm. Why well, that money's meant to last me the rest of my life, I had to fund it all out of that. Just amazing. We let our people down as badly as this. It's, it's just disgusting, to be honest with you. As an inspirational speaker, <coughs> going around, speaking to other people who've, who've fallen on hard times, difficult times, yeah. do you enjoy doing that? I enjoy it. Well, I'm, I'm trying to change the world. <laughs> on my own. Good. 
So I don't want. I, do, I go. To, I go to a lot of places: schools, colleges, universities, businesses. I do afternoon speaking, but I try and educate people. There's more to life than just work and whatever else you do. There's time to get out and do other stuff. Set yourself goals. Reach them goals. Then set yourself a bigger goal. It all works. It's, it, it's all part of your mental health. You see, I do worry. I, 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 maybe I'm wrong about this, but I do worry that people who are born with disabilities or get disabilities through accidents or no fault of their own, I do worry that if we treat them as victims and if they feel yeah. like victims, they're going to get trapped into a life of thinking, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And somehow, <coughs> you said the hell with it. I'm just going to do all these things. Yeah, like, especially with young kids what get born with disabilities, the parents wrap them up in cotton wool because they don't want them to get hurt. Because they're scared, yeah. Yeah, and the way I see it is don't wrap them up in cotton wool. Let them do what they want to do. They can do whatever they put their mind to. I'm setting myself a goal at the moment. I'm trying to get on I'm a celebrity to get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I am. To show that no matter whether you've got a disability, anything is possible. And if I can get onto that, Sort of actors and celebs get a bit scared of the creepy crawlers. Compared to what you've been through, that would be nothing, really, oh, would it? <laughs> breakfast, dinner and tea straight, though. You're not having that. <laughs> so I'm a celebrity. Is that the, that's the next big goal for Dave, is it? That's the next big goal for me. See if I can get Anton Deck to let me on I'm a celebrity to prove to everybody out there with disabilities anything's possible when you put your mind to it. Well, I have to say, I love your positive mental attitude. I have to ask you one thing that is not so easy, is 20 years we were in Afghanistan, 460-odd <coughs> of our soldiers killed, thousands, this is forgotten quite often, thousands wounded very seriously. And now there's a war happening again mm. in Ukraine. Does man never learn? They don't. They don't. And I have said to a lot of people, if it wasn't for my disability and having my family, my background's the military. Mm -hmm. I'd go out there tomorrow and help them if yeah. I could, you know what I mean? It's, it's my background, it's what I know. And I'd be out there tomorrow if I could. So. I believe you. The whole of the audience believes you. Yeah. And I have to say, Dave Watson, I've interviewed lots and lots of people um, on Talking Pints. People from all sorts of backgrounds, people who've succeeded, people who've overcome all sorts of difficulties. I think you're the sing one of the single most inspiring people I have ever met, and it's an absolute privilege to have you here tonight on GB News. And I can't wait to see you on I'm a Celebrity. <laughs> Get me out of here.